that's the. So it's good that we're. Oh, we're. I'm gonna check. It. There we go. <clears throat> Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and we've got a very special event today. I'm really excited about this. We've got the science team from NASA's New Horizons spacecraft here to talk with us about uh, all of the stuff that's happening and what's going to be happening shortly. So with, uh, with further ado, I'm going to, uh, to introduce you to uh, some, some uh, good friends of mine here. So first, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say hi to Alan Stern, who of course is the primary investigator of New Horizons and uh, Pluto's biggest fan, and uh, and he's gonna introduce the rest of his the rest of his team and that spacecraft that's right in front of him. Great. Okay. Yeah. Actually, our science team, Fraser, has about 50 people on it. Yeah. Uh, what we have here today are actually six of the postdocs, the young scientists who are working on New Horizons. We'll start with Kelsey Singer, and we can just go around and say what you do, where you. Uh, came here from and yeah. a little bit okay. about yourself. Hi, I'm Kelsey. Um, my background is in both astronomy and geology and geophysics. Um, I actually went to University of Colorado for undergrad and uh, went to Washington University in St. Louis for grad school. And now I'm very happily here at Southwest Research Institute working on the New Horizons mission. Say a little bit about what you do on New Horizons. So I do um, two kinds of things, working with the instruments and trying to um, figure out what kinds of observations are planned so that we can figure out what kind of science we can do with those observations. And then also some predictions for what we might see on Pluto um, in terms of the shape of Pluto and some of the geology. Josh. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Kammer. I'm the most recent addition to the postdoc team here at uh, Southwest Research. I just defended a thesis from Caltech this past September. I work predominantly on atmospheres, and so previously I worked on uh, some of the data coming back from Cassini looking at Titan. So we're going to apply some of that research and expertise to Pluto, which does have an atmosphere, albeit a very thin one. Um, and so the main instrument I'll be working on is the ALICE uh, UV spectrometer. And uh, we'll be looking for mainly in the stellar and solar occultations, finding out what the composition of Pluto's atmosphere is and all the different chemical species that exist there. Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Cook. Um, I got my PhD at, from Arizona State University in uh, 2007, so that probably makes me one of the more senior uh, <laughs> postdocs here, uh, but it is enjoyable. I've, I've, um, uh, my, most of my interest is in Pluto's surface and, and its atmosphere, as well as Sharon's surface. Um, I, I do, uh, in the past, I had done work on the, the motion distortion of the, of, uh, the, the MVIC instrument, one of the instruments on the, on the, on the spacecraft, so as it moves along in space, it uh, brings back images that are distorted by its motion. So uh, trying to undo that uh, was part of my original work here. But now I've moved on to uh, just doing whatever is thrown at me, like testing, uh, testing tools and um, uh, making predictions about the surface and uh, maybe a little bit about its atmosphere as well. Perfect. Alex. I'm Alex Parker. I did my, uh, my PhD, actually, in your neck of the woods, Fraser. Uh, I was at the University of Victoria. Um, and I defended back in 2011, and since then I've done a couple of postdocs um, remotely, but working for the mission, uh, one at Harvard and one at UC Berkeley, um, primarily invested in uh, searching for a post-Pluto encounter target in the Kuiper Belt. So after the Pluto mission um, finishes, the spacecraft isn't stopping, and so we'd like to send it on onward to something else. And uh, that search sort of culminated this summer. We have two new candidates. And um, we're now following those, characterizing them, and my, my, uh, my work has now moved back toward the inner solar system and in that I'm being folded into some of the, the Pluto encounter campaign um, from this far more distant stuff. But, um, you know, I, I just help out wherever I can at this point. So Alex may be the only astronomer on Earth that calls Pluto the inner solar system. <laughs> <laughs> You're working further out. It seems maybe appropriate. It's just a sliding scale. There you go, Amanda. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Zangari. I did my PhD at MIT and I finished up in about 2013. Uh, for the mission, I do software development for tools for analyzing data. And I also do stuff with the solar phase curve of Pluto on approach. Simon. So I'm Simon Porter. Uh, I did my PhD also at Arizona State, at the same advisor as Jason, uh, but then spent most of my time actually up at Lowell Observatory where Pluto is discovered. Um, and 
I work on mainly. Um, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> I, I work on mainly small satellites and orbits. Uh, so uh, working with this KBO characterization, as well as looking at um, detecting new moons uh, around Pluto on our way in. Um, initially, just to make sure we don't hit any dust that they might throw off. So we have an engineering purpose there. But then also, as soon as we don't, we're not worried about the, the engineering wise anymore. We look for them for science. Uh, you know, we discovered four new moons of. Uh, Pluto since the mission got uh, started. And Looks like their uh, their stream has stopped. I wonder if like an antivirus software came up. Well, while we're waiting for them to get their stream back, I'm going to give everyone some uh, some further information about this. So this is going to be a interactive experience so you can go ahead and ask any questions that you want of uh, of the team and I'll be able to pass them along. So there's a few places that you can do that. The first is that you can access uh, on Twitter and I think we're just going to co-opt the, uh, the New Horizons uh, hashtag right now. So if you uh, post a question on Twitter just use the hashtag New Horizons and I will uh, I'll be watching for that. Um, and then as well, uh, people who are familiar with the Hangouts that we do, you can always use the uh, Q&A app, which is, a, um, which is an app that's available on Google+. So right now, if you're watching this, you should see it says uh, Fraser Kane is interacting with the audience. And you can, uh, you can click that. And then you'll see the video. And then you'll get information uh, of all the questions that are over on the, uh, the right-hand side. And so you can, um, you can post some questions and vote up questions that you like and so on. So um, let's take a look and see if we've got any questions right now. And I will try and answer some questions before uh, uh, if anyone, let's see. Um, so William Walden wants to know, uh, are there any plans to extend the mission beyond Pluto and once the Pluto observations are done, and if so, what time frame? So I do know the answer to this question, which is that Pluto, this, this mission of, uh, of New Horizons is actually a flyby mission, so it's going to be going right past Pluto uh, at a very high velocity. And uh, hopefully when they come back, we'll be able to talk about this. But the gist of this is going to be that uh, once it's gone past Pluto, it's still going to have fuel, it's still going to have the ability to communicate with Earth, and it's still going to have the ability to do science. So the, the goal here is that it's going to go past Pluto, it's going to find another target. And this is what, what Alex was talking about, is that there's going to be other targets further along, and recently they actually just brought these up with the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, they identified some other targets for for New Horizons, and they're going to be moving to those targets afterwards. So it looks like we got everyone back. I I'm guessing a, a uh, some kind of antivirus scan went off or something. Yeah, power <laughs> failure. A power back. failure, perfect. Went into safe mode. Right. OK, good. Well, I just answered one of your questions, so I think I think uh, hopefully <clears throat> we can, I can save you that one. Uh, but uh, so before we uh, kind of get into everyone's questions, just let people know how they can answer, ask us some questions. So before we get to that, um, can we talk about uh, sort of the history so far? Uh, you know, it's been almost a decade since New Horizons was was launched. What are the major milestones, and and sort of where are we right now? Well, why don't I take that one, and then. Uh... We'll trade off as we go, but since I'm the only one here that's been around the entire project, <laughs> um, I'll take it. So we launched in January of 2006 in a very narrow launch window, actually. We only had three weeks uh, to launch in order to get the last opportunity for uh, a Jupiter gravity assist. Uh, after that, had we missed that launch window, we would have been flying direct to Pluto on a much longer 14-year trajectory, but we launched right in the middle of the window. And, and arrived at Jupiter for that gravity assist 13 months later in February of 2007. And in between, we had to check out all the spacecraft systems, check out all the instruments, get them calibrated for the encounter, and then plan the entire Jupiter encounter. And that all went very well. The Jupiter encounter lasted from January to June. And then uh, we started practicing this technique called hibernation that we use for the spacecraft. And we took baby steps at first, hibernating for a week at a time, then two weeks at a time, sort of jumping logarithmically to a month at a time, a couple months at a time. But after early 2008, when we had hibernation perfected, 
we've pretty much been in the same cycle every year where the spacecraft hibernates two-thirds of the time and it's awake about one-third for more calibrations, engine maneuvers, uh, some science that we've done along the way. Uh, but most of the time the spacecraft is taking care of itself and that allows the ground team of scientists and flight controllers as well as all the behind the scenes people who work on sequencing that is writing the programs that the spacecraft uses uh, to instruct itself through the Pluto encounter to design the entire Pluto encounter, work all the bugs out and get it under lock and key so that we're not trying to write all those codes in 2015. In fact, most of them were written in 2010, 11, and 12, debugged in 2013, and tested on the spacecraft. And since, since then, since two years ago in 2013, we've primarily been working on contingencies, uh, like the hazard ones that we talked about a little bit earlier that, that Simon brought up. We've been working on KBO search and other things. The spacecraft is now out beyond Neptune, the last planetary orbit it crossed before we reach Pluto. We're now... Uh, just, just a few days since the final hibernation period ended and in what we call the pregame period before January 15th when encounter begins. The next few weeks we'll be doing things like we did in those hibernation wake-ups in terms of software uh, uh, updates in terms of some calibrations and testing and then on January the 15th the first encounter observations begin and those will continue all the way through and beyond the encounter in July. And when you're saying encounter observations, these are the pictures that we're all hoping to see. Yeah, actually, uh, far out, um, we turn on all of the in situ instruments, the dust counter the, and the two plasma instruments called Pepsi and Swap, and we'll be making measurements with those of the interplanetary environment in which Pluto lives. In addition, we'll start using the cameras, primarily the, the LORI camera, which is the long focal length high resolution camera, but even that far out we, we will only see Pluto as a couple of pixels across. We won't get to better than Hubble until May, so we're using the camera primarily for the purpose of optical navigation, taking pictures of Pluto against the star fields. Those images are then downlinked to the ground where they're analyzed to do the astrometry of where Pluto falls relative to those stars which let us then compute a better targeting solution for the spacecraft. And by comparing where we are tracked to be going to what those images have to tell us, we can compute burn parameters for mid-course corrections on the way in. And through January, February, March, and April, that's the majority of what we're doing. The science starts to get really interesting in May. Well, I'm, I'm just going to share a picture here. This is, uh, this is a picture of Jupiter that was taken by New Horizons and, and Io. So this is the kind of quality of pictures that we're eventually going to be, going to be getting. So uh, I think it's, it's interesting that it's going to take sort of so long for, for the pictures to even be better than Hubble, but I guess it's, it's such a small object and it's, uh, you know, it's still a long ways off. Well, a couple things there. One, uh, we will get much better pictures than the one that you showed of Jupiter because we're going much closer to Pluto, orders of magnitude closer than we went to Jupiter. Our aim point for Jupiter was controlled by the, the orbital mechanics, the aim point for the Jupiter gravity assist, and it actually turned out to be very far away, almost four million kilometers from Jupiter. We'll pass only a few thousand miles above Pluto's surface. Um, but after we get to better than Hubble, you get this sort of geometric increase where every week the images are dramatically better than the week before. And at the end, we'll be making imagery that will ship to the ground that's good enough to spot objects smaller than a football field. And I think it's important for people to know as well that you're not going to be going into orbit around Pluto. That's sort of impossible with the amount of fuel that you have, that you're going to be doing this flyby. So it's going to be zooming right past Pluto, getting those great pictures up close, and then off to the next, the next destination. That's right, and all of our remote sensing instruments um, will be operating during the final few weeks, so we'll be getting infrared spectra, ultraviolet spectra, color imagery, uh, uh, black and white imagery, uh, both um, long focal length and mo moderate focal length. All the plasma and dust instruments will be operating. The entire suite of seven instruments um, will be trained on the Pluto system beginning in June. 
All right, so let's talk about the science then, because I think that's you know that this is the team that you've assembled today, and uh, and I know that most or all of the space missions have these these primary science objectives. These are the uh, the scientific observations that they're looking to make, the big questions that they're looking to to answer. And so I would love to give sort of each one of the researchers an opportunity to discuss sort of one of the primary science goals of the mission and how that relates to their to their field. And why don't we just uh, Sure. Well, Kelsey. Begin with Kelsey. Okay. Yeah. We'll just work around sure. the circle. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm mostly going to be looking at surface features, and one of the things that I worked on in my um, graduate work was craters. And so um, some people think a crater is just a hole in the ground, but it can tell you a whole lot about a whole bunch of different aspects, both about the evolution of the surface of Pluto. So craters excavate material, so you can get some sense of what's going on at depth rather than just at the very surface. Um, it also tells us about the age of the surface. So a lot of people know about um, a common technique that's pretty logical and straightforward is that if there's more craters, it's older. If there's less craters, it's younger. Um, you can also have craters that have been modified. So that tells you about the other surface processes that are modifying these craters. Um, and so it'll be really interesting to see what kinds of cratering we see on Pluto. And um, we don't expect necessarily to see a ton of craters on Pluto, but there should be some. And there'll definitely be a bunch of craters on Charon. And we also can relate that to the inner solar system and the bombardment history of the inner solar system. So it's going to be a really great data point that we currently don't have a lot of knowledge about. Great, Josh. Uh, so like I mentioned, I'll be working mainly at looking at Pluto's atmosphere. And Pluto's atmosphere is an interesting place because it's expected to be mo mostly made up of nitrogen, like our atmosphere here on Earth. Um, but like other bodies in the solar system, especially in the outer solar system, like Titan, for instance, uh, we also expect to find methane and a whole range of different hydrocarbon species that are often created from photochemistry that happens, even so far out. Uh, the, the solar flux still allows chemistry to happen, even on a very cold, very distant world. And so in this ALICE UV spectrograph is going to be picking out the fingerprints of all these different chemical species and be able to say uh, along the profile of the atmosphere how much of each kind of chemical species there is. And it'll be exciting to see how similar or different it is to other bodies in the solar system because we have a lot of atmospheric models already in place that we expect it might look like, but until we get there we don't actually know for sure. And are we at a, at a special time for Pluto's atmosphere where it uh, sublimates off the, I guess, off the surface? You know, we're at this this distance where Pluto's atmosphere is is con potentially going to be going through some changes, right? Right. As you might know, Pluto's orbit is very uh, relatively eccentric, so that at certain points in the uh, orbit, the temperature drops and you can collapse out a lot of the atmosphere, freezes onto the surface. Uh, we're a little bit past perihelion at the moment, so we expect that the atmosphere will be somewhat warmer and somewhat more easy to see using our instruments on board uh, New Horizons. Right, the perihelion, that's the closest point of its orbit towards the towards the sun. Yeah. In fact, since <clears throat> perihelion, the atmospheric pressure has been observed routinely from the Earth using stellar occultations, and it's more than doubled. So you're kind of seeing the kind of effect that happens, you know, uh, the longest day of the year isn't the hottest day of the year, but there's a there's a time delay right. in there exactly. because of thermal inertia or other effects. We're seeing the same kind of thing in in Pluto's terms. We're 25 years since perihelion, but that's only about the equivalent of one Earth month, one tenth of an orbit later. And so, as you get closer to the to Pluto, uh, you're going to be able to start looking at stars through this atmosphere and start to maybe pick out some some, you know, which will tell you the constituents of the atmosphere itself. Actually, we don't use stars very much. Um, we use two techniques. I'll speak to the first one, which is uh, called air glow. Uh, and then uh, I can hand it back to Josh, and he can talk about the solar occultation. So on the way in and on the way out, we use the ultraviolet spectrometer to look at the atmosphere for spectral emission lines that we can fingerprint to determine the composition of the atoms and molecules that are glowing in the atmosphere. Uh, and that, that'll actually begin about six weeks out. The main experiment, though, for the atmosphere is to actually watch the sun, the, the brightest star around from Pluto's perspective, shine through the atmosphere as on the encounter day. Uh, and that could tell us a lot more. Josh? Right. So as the spacecraft flies through the Pluto system, it'll pass into the shadow of Pluto. And that way, you'll be able to see, essentially, 
sunset or sunrise on Pluto from the perspective of the spacecraft. And so instead of looking at the emission features from air glow, instead you're looking at the absorption features as the sunlight passes through the atmosphere and you see what different chemical species are absorbing at various wavelengths that Alice can see. Yeah, and awesome. that gives us the composition as a function of altitude, mm -hmm. which is a very powerful uh, information set for the atmospheric modelers to use. And they'll get both the dawn and the dusk side because we'll watch the sunset and then we'll watch it rise on the other side of the planet. And we'll also do the same to look for any evidence of an atmosphere around the big moon Charon. And we can get down to levels more than a thousand times more rarefied than Pluto's atmosphere in searching for an atmosphere around Charon. So let's go to Jason. We'll talk about composition. All right. So um, <clears throat> uh, what I've been working on is the composition in the surface of Pluto, surface, surface of Charon. Uh, the main instrument for that is the, the Ralph instrument, which is broken into two separate parts, MVIC and LISA. LISA does this nice thing where it takes spectral cubes. So imagine an image, but on each plane of the image is a different wavelength of light. So you know, light can be broken up into a rainbow. Uh, here we're looking at infrared light um, broken down. Um, on Pluto, when we, from the ground, when we look at it, um, all we get is one point of light for Pluto. We know there's methane ice there, nitrogen ice and CO ice. And on Charon, we know there's water and, and ammonia ice. Uh, but w when we are flying by, we can actually map out where these places are. We already know from ground base that, that the pl uh, surface of Pluto is patchy. So there are places where there's pure methane ice and places where there's more nitrogen ice or CO ice. And really knowing what it is up close is going to tell us a little bit about how the atmosphere collapses over different cycles or how, how these things migrate over the surface. Um, for Sharon, with the, with the ammonia, it's a little bit more, uh, for me at least, a slightly ex more exciting story because the ammonia, uh, at least according to some, some ideas, may not even, should not even be there, should be destroyed over a short time. Um, so why is there ammonia there? Where is it? Is it concentrated in regions or is it just dispersed all over the surface. Um, these are some of the questions that New Horizons will answer pretty quickly, I think. And by the way, this composition mapping spectroscopy has never been carried on a first flyby reconnaissance mission before. So we'll actually get a spectrum at every pixel, more than a quarter million places on Pluto. So we can correlate all the composition with all the geology, for example, and with the volatile transport that feeds the atmosphere. Very, very powerful. Even Voyager didn't have that kind of technology aboard. We had to wait for missions like Galileo and Cassini that have done that as orbiters. So this is brand new, bringing on first reconnaissance. Alex? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, my background is more astrophysics. And mm -hmm. most of the work I've done for the mission so far has been further out in the solar system. And uh, uh, my PhD work was on um, binary Kuiper Belt objects, which there are, there are many, many objects in the Kuiper Belt that have binary companions. And the Pluto system is, is the largest example of that um, uh, that has this sort of you know, comparable mass secondary in the system. So the, the, the balance point of the system, the barycenter, is actually outside both bodies. Um, and then, uh, so, so what I'm talking about wasn't really built into the mission proposal because, because we didn't know about this when it was developed, but Pluto has many, you know, it has a lot of other satellites other than Pluto, or sorry, other than Charon, which was, you know, discovered decades ago and was one of the prime targets of the mission. But right around the time of launch and then in subsequent years, we found four more satellites. And uh, these guys are much smaller and much more comparable to sort of the typical sizes of Kuiper Belt objects further out. And the system itself, sort of pound for pound, has more satellites in it than any other body that we know of, really. And um, it's an incredibly densely, dynamically packed system. The satellites are about as close together as you can put them without making the system go wildly unstable. They're all very circular and very coplanar. And this is this is very building. This system is a very uh, it's a very it's very theoretically challenging um, getting the system to grow these satellites after some kind of, say, uh, the share information event where maybe a large collision happened and you stripped some material off of proto-Pluto and then built some stuff in a disk. It's, there, there's still no clear answer as to how you get these satellites in place. And so one of the things that, we're, that New Horizons is doing now that maybe you know, wasn't in the prime mission plan is studying these small satellites and uh, a lot of the, say, the compositional information and shape information uh, that we're going to get off of these small satellites will um, help us nail down the origin of that system as a whole and where those small satellites came from, how they grew, and how they stayed there. They're so small, in fact, that small collisions with, say, 
type world object streaming through that would just leave a crater on, on Charon or Pluto could actually um, push one of these into an unstable orbit or destroy it entirely. So the fact that these delicate little satellites are still sitting there is kind of a puzzle. Um, and then uh, additionally, uh, we're searching for, and I think Simon will talk about this more, we're going to search for more satellites. So right now, this, the, the smallest of these satellites that we know of um, from Earth, from, say, Hubble observations, they're as faint as the faintest objects we've ever discovered in the solar system. We've, you know, we've, they're comparable in brightness to the faintest things we've ever seen. So we can't really go that much deeper with Hubble. But as Pluto flies, or sorry, as New Horizons flies through the system, it will, it will have an unprecedented view and be able to search for these smaller satellites. So we ex expect to be able to detect some, you know, interesting sort of, you know, uh, meta moons where you have more than one in the same orbit kind of thing, or, um, or maybe some in, in orbits that are very difficult to survey from, from uh, Earth. And there could be even more rich dynamics in the system than the incredible richness that's already there. In fact, Amanda's starting a betting pool on how many satellites we'll find. Yeah. <laughs> I want in on that action. <laughs> that will bet. Go ahead. Not only the satellites, Alan, but also how big Pluto is. That's Because of Pluto's thin atmosphere, that's screwed up our ability to measure the radius accurately from Earth. And so New Horizons will provide that measurement. And actually, a lot of us are very excited about that. So most of the work that I'm doing with the mission um, happens on approach when Pluto and Charon are still points of light. Um, the, as the angle between the spacecraft, the Sun, and Pluto changes, um, even if Pluto st it s stayed the same, um, the amount of light it would reflect would change um, and be different be just because that angle is getting larger, sort of like the moon gets brighter when it's more full. And However, Pluto, it's not a static body. As it rotates, it's got um, very large variations in brightness, and it's actually the second, uh, it has the second largest amount of variation in the solar system, second only to Jupiter's moon, Iap sorry, Saturn's moon, Iapetus. And, you know, what, what's going on there is kind of weird. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what the mapping of the surface will be like and what that's going to be. Simon. Yeah, well, so I, yeah, the, the two things I really want, want to, to find out are, you know, are these, these uh, co-orbital things, these quasi-satellites, uh, which we see at Saturn. So it's, it's not unprecedented that we can have these, if, if we're going to find more moons in close to Pluto, they could be on these sort of co-orbital uh, cases where, like, there's a big one and a small one gets pushed around by it. Um, that would be really cool if we found that out, because that would just mean there, there are moons everywhere we can put it in the system. It would just be really packed in there. Um, and also, just uh, you know, as Alex mentioned, Pluto probably formed from a giant impact from two Pluto-ish sized bodies hitting each other, and then the big one became they reformed into two objects. The big one was Pluto, and the small one was Charon, and then yeah, so sort of debris around it that eventually formed the small guys. Uh, but it's really, really hard to do, uh, just to just do a numerical simulation. And one of the major free parameters in all this is how, just how small are the small moons? We don't actually know. We just know they're small. Uh, so figuring out the sizes is instantly going to give us a calibration on this entire process. And understanding this giant impact process is really important, because the other giant impact that happened in our solar system was Earth got hit by something the size of Mars and formed the moon. So, you know, understanding the, how Pluto and Charon formed, we're basically understanding how Earth and the Moon formed. Um, it, it's our own history. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, I really do want to find out why the contrast ratio on Pluto is so high. Because uh, it, is, it is very dramatic. Uh, Pluto is going to have extremely bright areas, extremely dark areas, and maybe some areas that are in between. Um, it, it's not going to be just like you see, you know, some pictures of the Saturnian satellites, and you know, they kind of look the same all over the place on the surface. Uh, Pluto is going to be crazy. It's going to be this this kind of stuff over here, and this kind of completely different kind of stuff over there. There's going to be lots of geology going on there. So I'd like to talk a bit. Part, the thing that really fascinates me about this mission is the hazards involved. That that you're having to sort of thread the needle here. You're trying to get as close as possible to Pluto to get the best observations that you can, and at the same time, you're having to keep the spacecraft safe as you make a flyway through the system, which is going to be filled with ice and all kinds of stuff. So I would love to know sort of how you guys came to this decision and where you're sort of drawing this line. 
Okay, I'll start, but I'm actually going to migrate the answer over a little bit um, to talk about some of the modeling that we're doing. And uh, uh, Alex and Simon are deeply involved in that, and, and they can pick up where I leave off. So actually, uh, we first got worried about debris in the system in the very room here that you see us in. We were having a science team meeting, and when uh, Styx and Kerberos were discovered, the two most recent moons, we realized that they were so small that, as Alex said earlier, when they're pelted by something in the Kuiper belt, let's say a boulder, comes at them at a speed like a rifle bullet and makes a crater, all the spray that comes out won't land back on the surface of the small moon that doesn't have enough gravity. That stuff gets out into orbit around Pluto. It doesn't have enough energy in most cases to escape Pluto. It gets trapped in orbit. And all that little shrapnel is dangerous to us because we're going so fast. Even being hit by something the size of a rice pellet there's basically no good place to hit the spacecraft. So you don't want to go where there is debris. And our initial models indicated that the chance of the spacecraft uh, getting a fatal debris impact was very high. That's what you get when you do back of the envelope calculations. As we did more sophisticated modeling, we found that the odds of the spacecraft getting hurt are pretty low, down around tenths of a percent at the most. So you could probably fly 300 New Horizons through the Pluto system on our trajectory, and all but one would probably survive, maybe all of them, because we only have upper limits to the hazard information. Um, on approach, we'll be taking images, images that are much better than what you can do with the Hubble. And so we should be able to determine the presence of new moons, debris sheets, rings, things like that, and then we have a pretty sophisticated set of modeling software that lets us take the new things that we discover and see how that changes the probability of our getting hurt. And we can not only assess it for our current trajectory, but for other trajectories which we already have targets for and have written sequences to do Pluto flyby science on. And then if we determine that the baseline trajectory becomes dangerous. I think that's very low probability. But if we do determine that, then we can switch to one of the others if they're safer. And they were chosen to, in principle, be safer. Not as good for the science, so we don't want to do that accidentally, or I should say we don't want to do that um, uh, without a lot of thought, because we don't want to sacrifice science unless there's real danger out there. But like all good spacecraft missions, we have our backup plans in the drawer. Now, the key to this is twofold. One, making and analyzing the images, which I think Alex can speak to, which the LORI instrument will be doing, and then the hazard models that Simon can speak to that actually link what we find. You guys want to flip it around? We'll flip that around, yeah. Yeah, you can flip that around. And, and linking what we find to uh, uh, estimates of the risk to the spacecraft. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. It's, uh, yeah, so, you know, there are, because it's, it's such a dynamically packed system, you know, there, it's really hard to stick in moons and make them stable. So there's some areas where we think there, there could be moons. Um, you know, the most likely ones that we find is one of these co-orbitals. Um, and if that's the case, then we're not too worried because they're about, they pose about the same risk as the moons that we already know about and that we're already planning for the risk. Um, the really risky thing, that we can't detect at all from the ground or from the Hubble is if there is a, a tiny little moon that's inside of Sharon's orbit, which is actually stable if it's in a really crazy high inclination orbit. And we couldn't see that from Hubble because Pluto's too bright. And it actually, the glare from Pluto means that you can't actually <laughs> see when these guys in there. Uh, so if that's the case, that Until you get closer. Yeah, till you get closer. And then when, once you get closer in, then we have to you know, find them in these pictures using, uh, you know, our long-range camera on the spacecraft. We need to pick out where they are relative to Pluto and get nice precise measurements of where they are, turn that into an orbit around Pluto, and then model where all the dust goes from them, and then model what that, what is the risk to spacecraft based on that dust. So, you know, this is something that you would, if you just had plenty of time to do, you, you just take several months to do it and make sure you do every step right and just do it nice sequentially like that, we've got um, a few days, basically. 30, 31 hours. Yeah, from, from when we get the last image that will make that will change our decision to when we actually have to make the decision. 
uh, and then we have a, a similar sort of quick turnaround. I think it's like 48-ish hours uh, beforehand. So we have a couple of these very quick turnaround events where we get data on the ground, and then we have to just very quickly fit it, very quickly figure out what the dust is, and then very quickly figure out what the hazard to the spacecraft is. Um, and it's, it's going to be really intense. Uh, so we've been practicing it a lot. Um, uh, they're actually doing a practice session right now over in uh, Maryland uh, for the dust side of it. Um, and it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be really quick science. <laughs> yeah. The, well, you've got a four-hour turnaround or four-hour delay each way to communicate just with the spacecraft, right? Yeah, that's built into the time time period that we have. Essentially, there's this this period where you, you make the decision which trajectory you want to be on. It has to happen at a certain time because the earlier that that uh, decision is made, the less fuel it takes to make a course correction, essentially. And so there is a you know finite time at which we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to change our minds anymore. And we get the you know the other side of that coin is that the closer we are to the Pluto system, the more sensitive we are to dust and to small satellites. So you want to make that decision as late as possible. And so that's basically you're you're sandwiching yourself between these two you know rock and a hard place. And uh, there's this team of us that that are are working on this, and we have you know. We have multiple redundancy on on every person on the team. So in case you know someone gets food poisoning on one night, we got someone that can step in and take over. Um, uh, if you know if one set of computers goes down, we have another set of computers in a completely different state or whatever that can run all this software um, because that decision has to be made very quickly. Uh, so the the real you know the real crux of the matter is. Um, there, there could be dust all throughout the system, and there almost certainly is dust throughout the system. Uh, but there's a, a number of unknowns at this point. Um, one, we've never detected dust in the system. We've never seen it. Uh, we've searched with Hubble. We've looked at stellar occultations. So a star goes behind the system, and you look to see if the star dims like it's going behind a ring or something. We've never seen that. But So we can put you know, upper limits on how much dust could be there. But those upper limits aren't very useful at this point, They're, particularly since we fly so close to Pluto. Um, but one of the big unknowns, so one of the big unknowns is whether or not there are more satellites in the system. If you stick a small satellite in a you know highly inclined orbit around Pluto, uh, that that's a hazardous moon. Dust that it produces hangs around and it hangs around in a place that could be hazardous to the spacecraft. Um, we can't search for that from the ground, so we need to search from it from New Horizons. The other thing that's unknown and it has to be built into our models is how many bullets are out there? We don't we don't actually know a lot about the Kuiper belt down at sizes relevant to the impactors that would drive up this dust. So um, we have to build in sort of an uncertainty in the amount of amount of these bullets that could be flying around and kicking up dust because the dust doesn't live forever in the system. It goes away after a while. So you have to resupply it with more impactors. Um, and we're going to learn a lot about that about the the amount of impactors from the the craters on Pluto and Charon. But that's a little bit late. To make any decisions about avoiding any dust that is being produced, so we have to do we have to do this up front. Right. Exactly. So so we've got about uh, about 15 minutes left. I know you guys all have to run. So and I got a pile of great questions that are coming in from the internet itself. So I'm going to start firing these at you rapid fire. And uh, if you can keep your your answers shorter, then we can kind of get through as many of these questions as possible. So uh, so first, I got a question from Cecil Morgan, which is how much of Pluto's surface is going to be imaged? Um, we're going to image. We think we're going to be able to image everything. However, one hemisphere, the hemisphere on flyby day that we're closest to, will get much better imagery than the far side that we last see one half Pluto rotation three and a half days out. Um, your, your questioner may also know that some parts of Pluto um, are currently in polar shadow, just like Antarctica goes into polar shadow in the winter. There's no sunlight at all. We're even going to try to image that because after we pass Pluto, we'll look back into the glare of the sun and try to photograph the night side specially illuminated by the big moon Charon. We've arranged all the geometry, the arrival date, everything to make that experiment possible. Sharon, Sharon shine. And yeah. Sharon shine. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so uh, here's a question for you. It comes from Fabio Moretti. Um, uh, once the probe is done with Pluto and the KBO objects, will its power last long enough to get data from interstellar space like Voyager? So I know it has an RTG on board. How long is it going to be able to continue sending us data? So we think we can operate the spacecraft out into the late 2030s if nothing breaks or even if some things break because we have backups. 
and that'll take us out to between 90 and 100 astronomical units from the sun. And not as far as Voyager is, but Voyager has two RTGs, so more power on board. We only have one. It's, it's this guy right here. That's right. <laughs> However, we have much more sensitive instruments for studying the heliosphere because they're built on 2000s technology instead of 1970s technology. So by flying this mission all the way out there, if NASA funds that extension, uh, would be a very, very powerful mission for heliospheric science, potentially for Kuiper Belt science, maybe even inner Oort cloud science, depending upon what we learn as we go. And so I guess if you get better telescopes, perhaps you know James Webb can be called upon to help you out find other targets down the road, you know, you're going to go past, I know you're going to go past Pluto, you're going to go past one additional target. How many, how much maneuvering do you have down the road to be able to keep hopping to object to object? you want to take it out? Sure. We have, a uh, current budget is about 130 meters per second of speed can be altered in the spacecraft. And so if you burn at a time, that adds up into a distance over later time. So the earlier we make a correction, the larger space we can potentially visit. Um, we have two candidate targets we could visit. We can't visit them both. They're kind of actually on opposite sides of the trajectory, and they, they are very, um, the time of encounter is very similar for both of them. One of them would require far less fuel than the other. One of them uses sort of less than half our fuel budget. The other one uses almost all of our fuel budget to reach. So if we pick the lower delta V target, the one that requires less fuel, we would have some maneuvering capability left if we found a target further out. How much we would have left, uh, left is unclear. It would depend on the, the amount of um, cleanup that was required to, to do the image gun approach and things like this. Um, we'd have to do that budgeting calculation once we kind of knew how that was going. Um, but we would have some left, and we could potentially target something much further out. We know there are these much more distant populations. The odds of finding something that would fall in that small cone are very small, um, but there are a lot of unknowns. And so James Webb wouldn't be a very good tool for this, but something like LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, um, or the Hypers Prime Cam on uh, Subaru, for example. These are very powerful survey instruments, and potentially down the road we could use them to do deeper, more distant searches. So it, hopefully the, the telescope technology gets better as you keep further and further out, and, and it can, you know, they can keep supplying you with targets. Our nominal flyby date for the Kuiper Belt targets is the very end of 2018 or the, the early 2019 timescale, and that's roughly when LSST comes online. So it's, it's sort of a nice timescale to start maybe thinking about doing things further out. Uh, okay, so this question comes from Laurel Kornfeld. Um, uh, it says, New Horizons does not have a magnetometer aboard. Can the instruments it does have detect whether Pluto has a magnetosphere? Okay, so I'll, I'll field that one. Um, we don't have anybody from our plasma team here. We, th we thought long and hard about flying a magnetometer, but the associated cost, not of the little magnetometer, but of making your spacecraft so magnetically clean that you can detect weak signals from small planets as you go by um, was prohibitive. However, the swap and Pepsi instruments that we have can tell us indirectly if Pluto has a magnetic field and a, a magnetosphere. And uh, the plasma team is very interested in exactly that question, so we'll be analyzing the data to look for those signatures. It's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so, so I've got another question here. I've got a few questions here. I'll just sort of synthesize it, which is, um, you talked a bit about moons, about the dust in the system, and how you've been looking for rings. What do you think are the chances that you are going to find some kind of ring system there? Well, let's, why don't we do it with a vote? How many people think we will find no satellites or rings in the data? We got uh, one vote for that. <laughs> well, I think we won't many, find rings. I do think we could find satellites, but... I think they're different things. Yeah. And how many people think that we're likely to find uh, moons or rings? The system is pathological or, that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about rings. Yeah, I want to see the rings vote. Hold yeah. on, can I see the rings? You want us to rings. vote rings only? This, I mean, yeah. we're all flipping a coin on that one. Right. And I mean, we just, we just this last year, discovered the first um, rings around uh, a, an asteroid-like body. And that was the first time we'd ever seen something around something smaller than a giant planet, right? So this was, you know, that was a real proof of concept, right? The, this idea that you could hold on to rings around something that's getting buffeted around by the giant planets that has very weak gravity itself, and so solar radiation pressure, for example, could strip these things away. So, like, once we saw that, I'm sitting there going, yeah, there's, Pluto's pathological enough. It's, it's got satellites wherever you can put satellites. Yeah, why not? It's probably got a gigantic ring system that we've never and seen. And here's, here's the thing. We're going to have a technique... When we get on the far side of Pluto and can look back, special geometry, 
called forward scattering geometry. It's just like when you're, you know, you're in a room in, in, the, in the evening and the sun is setting, and all of a sudden all those dust motes in the air become visible that you couldn't see earlier in the day. That's actually got to do with the lighting geometry. And that will allow us to do about 1,000 times, maybe even 10,000 times, better in terms of searching for faint dust assemblages, sheets, rings, than you can do from the Earth. So when you get three or four orders of magnitude, more depth, um, you're very likely to find something, I think. Whether, we actually, whether Pluto does or doesn't present that is really a function of time. The best models indicate that Pluto's rings come and go, and whether we arrive at a time when one or more satellites have rings, um, we'll just have to see. So that's part of the excitement. Well, well, maybe you could add the that if a if an object has rings, then that automatically makes it a planet, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, so, so that's, well, I wouldn't yeah. go that far. I that, think, that might be well, a sort of a workaround. You know, uh, okay. I think the hallmark is really when it's big enough to be rounded by self gravity, when it knows it's it, it's it's really a large object, no longer controlled by mechanical strength. I think that's the right boundary, not what orbits around it, because right, we know well, that even small asteroids can have. Um, ring structures. This was just discovered in the last year. I don't yeah, think that's with, a very good discriminator. Yeah, with with Charlico, was it? Yeah. There, um, there's, there's a very famous image of Saturn, a couple of them, right? Black illuminated, and so you can see the rings illuminated, but there's this very distant hazy ring. Is the Phoebe ring? Um, and that's probably more like what the rings of Pluto would look like, these big, broad, fat toruses, as opposed to really confined, narrow rings. Although those could exist. I mean, the narrow ones could, but finding a big torus of dust like, like you see in the outskirts of the Saturn system back illuminated like that is, uh, I think, quite likely. So i got a question here that comes from Tony Jebson, which is, are you expecting to see organics? And I guess this put this in context, right? They yeah. found organics on the surface of Rosetta, right? Yeah, sure, standpoint, to radiolysis. Yeah, so as I mentioned, there's lots of photochemistry that can happen with just starting with methane and also this nitrogen that's around. If you get enough energy, you can break apart nitrogen gas into these nitrogen atoms that then combine with uh, carbon and hydrogen to form a whole range of different organic species. Um, whether you consider them precursors to what we understand life uses, that's a little different. But just from a pure organic chemistry standpoint, we expect lots of it to be there. Right. Chase. Yeah. Um, just like Josh, Josh said, um, uh, basically UV light that, that happens to penetrate uh, Sharon's surface or Pluto's surface, it will have it will play with the chemistry on the, of, the, of the ices, and you'll get. Um, and we already see. And, we already see these. The the lightest of the heavier hydrocarbons. Right, we see the methanes there. Um, we're basically on the detection, of the verge of detecting, or having just detected ethane on the surface, a little bit bigger than, than mm. methane. Um, but there's a whole host of things that you can have acetylene, ethylene, um, and they all eventually are, they could be formed in the atmosphere and then snow out. So, uh, yeah, they'll probably be there. So I've got a question from Charles Eubanks, and the, and the gist here is um, how many pixels are you going to get of Pluto with your best possible image? Well, that's a trick question <laughs> because the <laughs> yeah, the, like I know you can stack them later on, the, you know, but like the field of view, yeah, as many pixels there are there are in the camera, which in the case of our biggest format camera, it's about five thousand pixels um, tall, and then it'll be five thousand pixels wide when you sweep over the entire object. And so you can do the math. That's 25 megapixels. Um, but when we get closest, and we're looking just at postage stamps up close, at small, like through a soda straw, looking at narrow regions, we'll have the same 25 megapixels, or in the case of using Lori, about one megapixel, right, on a on a very tiny patch of Pluto, at much even much higher resolution. And so you're going to have identified some targets as you're doing that inbound approach, and then you're going to try and actually select those regions. We, it's much safer from the standpoint of, of uh, uh, risk to the encounter, because we only get one shot at this, to pre-program all that and test the heck out of it. So we will not be looking for interesting features on approach and uh, replanning the encounter. We've already done that based upon the Earth-based data sets, and we've tried to be smart about it, but I can promise you after the fact, when we get 2020 hindsight on Monday morning, actually it'll be Wednesday morning in this case, you know, like Monday morning quarterbacking, um, we'll wish we'd done some things differently because we'll know so much more, 
and so all of us will want a second mission to Pluto. <laughs> Go back and do that right. Right. And so what will be the, the resolution? How large of objects will we be able to see on the surface of Pluto? All well, the smallest scales we'll get to are about 70 meters per pixel. So uh, actually Amanda has done uh, a great job of taking imagery of places on Earth and converting it to the resolution of our best imagery on Pluto. When you look down on New York City, for example, with the, the, um, the analogous images that Amanda has made, you can see the Hudson River, wharfs on the Hudson. You can look in Central Park and count the ponds. It's pretty impressive what we'll be able to do at Pluto. I don't think we expect to see any wharfs. <laughs> wharfs, yeah. Um, okay, so I've got a bunch of questions about just the communication technology. So what is the, the transmission speed that you're getting to and from the spacecraft? <laughs> Kelsey, you want to take that one? You don't want to take that one. It's about 1,000 bits per second. Yeah. Um, and so if you took a picture with your iPhone and it's like a 3 megabyte file or something, not talking light delay here, just the time it takes for the spacecraft to send that back to us, it's about nine hours. Yeah, so actually, uh, though, there are ways to do better than that, and we will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a, a real breakthrough mission. We're doing it under an extreme cost cap compared to former Outer Planets missions. Uh, uh, Voyager was about five times as expensive as New Horizons. And had we gotten far out of the cost cap, we would probably never have launched because the mission would have been canceled. So one of the things that we intentionally saved money on is communication speed. We've put all of our money into great sensors and great capability to collect data. And uh, as, uh, as you were just hearing from Alex, our nominal transmission speed is about 1,000 bits per second from Pluto, but we can actually transmit a little faster and use both radios at the same time and get up to about 3 kilobits per second. That would drive you nuts looking at the Internet, you know, for pages to load and things like that. Um, but using that, in conjunction with onboard JPEG compression that the spacecraft can do on the imagery, we can actually get individual images to the ground at the rate of about one an hour. So the spacecraft will take a lot more data than we can send home at flyby. You'll see about a thousand images on approach, and you'll see mouthwatering images from the day of closest approach. But most of the data won't come down until weeks and months later. So the surprises will just keep raining down from New Horizons all the way across 2015 and 2016, it'll take us till October of 2016 to get everything on the ground. Right. New Horizons is going to have a lot of time on its hands after it uh, That's right. makes its flyby. So, Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and so I wanted to uh, give people an opportunity to find out sort of more about how they can follow the work that your team is doing and really stay in contact with you as, we, uh, as the mission progresses because things are going to start getting really exciting. So where can they find out more? Well, you can, of course, Google up the mission. You can find lots of technical papers. You can find our website, and there you can subscribe to New Horizons News, and you should be getting various kinds of push news from myself, from the mission team, uh, press releases that come out of NASA and the project, et cetera, uh, very frequently during the flyby. Um, in fact, uh, we'll be filling your mailbox up around the time of encounter. But in addition, we're doing a lot of social media. There are several Twitter feeds from New Horizons, Amanda runs a blog called Postcards from Pluto. We've got a Facebook page, and there are going to be more and more of those kinds of channels that are coming. Fantastic. So so maybe we can do this again then. Hope so. Right. We'd love to. Awesome. Okay, well, uh, just for everyone watching, I just just want to thank you all for, for taking the time to give us an update on the mission. It's really sad. I'm so glad that the spacecraft woke up from this latest hibernation. And, uh, of course, on Universe Today, we're going to be covering this in minute detail. Uh, but, uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Frazier. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye now.